Hi, HTTP. I'm watching a digital inclusion summit from home, and I'm super excited about all the conversations you all are going to have related to broadband access and affordability, diversity in tech, as well as the future of work. Congratulations to the Hispanic Telecommunications and Technology Partnership for organizing your inaugural Digital Inclusion Summit. This discussion and these that are taking place during the event could not have come at a more perfect time because not only are we in the midst of a digital age, we are in the midst of a moment of unprecedented uncertainty due to the COVID-19 pandemic. This time period has placed the importance of access to affordable, reliable broadband front and center our Latinx, Black, and Indigenous communities are disproportionately impacted by the lack of access to broadband and the devices needed to navigate the internet. This issue is systemic, and we must meet the moment because no one in this country should be sitting on sidewalks outside of a restaurant or in their hot cars in the parking lot to learn or work remotely. Our economy, democracy, and the personal dignity of those who are unable to participate in the digital age because of geographic location or socioeconomic status are all impacted when our communities are not connected. But as HTTP has mentioned, it's not simply access to broadband that creates or sustains a digitally inclusive society. We must ensure these tools can be used to empower our most vulnerable communities. Our policies must help shape the ground and the future of work to ensure Latinos are able to grow and sustain their businesses in a changing economy. And for those who are at the most risk of losing their jobs due to automation, we must work to reskill and upskill those individuals so that they can continue to provide for their families. Lastly, we have to ensure that diverse voices are represented in the tech and telecom space. We can't create an inclusive future without technologists and policymakers who understand the needs of our communities. That's why I created the Early Career Staff Diversity Initiative at the FCC, so that we can recruit students from Hispanic survey institutions, HBCUs, and other communities of color to participate in our internship, attorney honors, and engineering programs. I'd love to see those efforts modeled throughout the public and private sectors because, as HTTP says, the future is digital and the voices are diverse and the impact is personal. Thank you. My name is Amy Nojosa, and I'm the president and CEO of MANA, a national Latina organization. MANA is a national grassroots membership organization with chapters, individual members, and affiliates across the country. We represent the interests of Latina women, youth, and families on issues that impact our communities. We contribute the leading Latina voice on many of the major issues in the public sphere, particularly in the areas of education, health and well-being, financial literacy, equal and civil rights, and immigration reform. Our chapters and affiliates provide programming locally to educate and empower our communities nationwide. Our values are rooted in serving the community through leadership development, educational workshops, mentoring the next generation of leaders, and building the structures to support continued Latina success. MANA fundamentally believes that education and access to technology are central to building the strength of our communities nationwide. We are committed to closing the digital divide, providing equal access to educational opportunities, advocating for appropriate educational funding, protecting students from hate speech and bullying in all forms, and promoting STEM education. This means we want to see equal treatment and protection across the internet ecosystem, the preservation of constitutional principles online, the protection of personal privacy, safe user experiences, the end of algorithmic discrimination, closing the digital divide, of course, and then diversity in all areas of tech. One in five women in the United States today is Latina. By 2060, that number will be one in three. This is why it is so important for us to join our fellow members of HTTP to use our collective voice to bring our issues and our place in these conversations to light. Latinos are the workforce of the present and the future. So now is the time for us to insist upon equity in the sector. This is why we're so excited to have this conversation for you today. And now I'm gonna turn it over to the HTTP Executive Director, Alejandro Rourke, to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Amy, and to our friends at Manam. As we discuss the importance of working together to promote durable connectivity solutions, 
we would be remiss if we didn't directly acknowledge the important role that representational leadership at all levels of government, media, and in the tech workforce plays in achieving our inclusive tech future that benefits everyone. Foundational to our ability to create digital tools, culturally responsive digital skills education, and to shaping the public perception and shared understanding of the lives, experiences, and contributions of communities of color is creating spaces and tables where we are able to speak for ourselves and on our own terms and through our own unique prism, which is colored by the way that we experience the world. Achieving our goal of an inclusive digital future requires an all hands on deck approach because it is only when we are able to harness the best of what each of us can bring to the table that we can effectively break through the intellectual glass ceilings currently limiting the power of our collective genius. Today, I have the opportunity of sitting down with April Rain, creator and founder of hashtag Oscar So White, Lucy Flores, former Nevada Assemblywoman and CEO of the Luz Collective, Alberto Mejilla, Deputy Director uh, for NALAC, the National Association of Latino Arts and Culture, Victor Duenas, writer and producer for the film BB, and Ana Flores, founder of We All Girl Latina, to share why they think representation is critical to our economy and for our society and to the future of everything. Thank you to you, Alejandro, and HTTP for having me here today on this amazing panel. Uh, in January of 2015, I was still a practicing attorney, and I was practicing campaign finance law. I had absolutely no nexus to the in entertainment industry other than I was an avid movie watcher, you know? And so the Oscars were like my Super Bowl. There were special snacks involved. I would rope off the TV so everybody knew this was mommy's night. Um, um, and after the nominations came out, I would actually attempt to see all of the best picture and best actor and best actress um, films um, so that I could really talk my stuff you know, afterwards and say who was wrong or, you know, that something was well-deserved. Um, so in that morning, January 2015, I was getting ready for work uh, and I was down in my family room because one of the presenters of the nominations, the Oscar nominations that year, was Thor, uh, Chris Hemsworth from the Avengers series. And I said, hey... Thor is going to be in a three-piece suit. I need him on the biggest TV we have in the house in HD. So here I am putting on my skirt <laughs> while sitting on the couch. Um, and it struck me category after category, there were no people of color nominated in any of the acting categories. And let's remember, this is 20 slots. Um, best actress, best, best actor, best actress, best supporting actor, best supporting actress, zero. Uh, and this was the year that gave us Selma, uh, that gave us Beyond the Light. So it wasn't as if there weren't quality performances. And so I picked up my phone being sarcastic, as I very often am on Twitter. And I said, Oscar so white, they asked to touch my hair. And that was it. Uh, this was an organic thing. I was being snarky and I went on to work. I checked in on Twitter around lunchtime and the hashtag based on that one tweet was trending around the world. Uh, and then I had to figure out if I was going to continue this conversation that people were having, you know, if I wanted to be the leader of whatever this thing was. And, and so one of the things I'll say to people is that, um, you know, you have to choose. You have, you have to choose if you're going to be the face of something um, when something may go unintentionally viral or, you know, there have been times when I've had tweets that um, I have intended to go viral um, and they have. And then it's like, okay, well, what do you do with that momentum? Who do you talk to? What do you learn? What is your, what is your goal, right? And so one has to be prepared um, in determining, you know, now that you've got the floor, <laughs> what are you going to say, you know, and, and what are your goals? And that's absolutely true with respect to tech policy. You know, once we get that opportunity to have a seat at the table or demand such, um, you know, we need to make sure that we're ready to go with a plan, with an outcome. Um, and so now what we see six years later, as you mentioned, the Academy made some changes. We can have an argument about whether they were actually worth anything. Um, but what I think is more important is that people, you know, consumers like you and me are being more savvy and intentional about our choices with respect to entertainment. And I think the same thing is happening in tech. We're realizing now that we have much more power and we're thinking about how we're going to spend our hard earned dollars, whether, you know, post pandemic, you know, in an actual movie theater or right now with streaming services. Same thing with tech, right? <laughs> There's nobody that is doing it 
all by themselves. And so consumers realize that they have choices. And so those companies, the industries, the brands need to be thinking about how they are best representing the demographic that they want to reach, right? And that has to start at the top. You cannot have middle managers who are saying, yes, you know, Black Lives Matter, Brown Lives Matter, we get it, we want to be on board. And then the C-suite is an incredibly homogenous group, typically of white men who are not providing the support and the resources, meaning money, uh, to actually make the changes that are necessary. We can no longer wait for the big studios, the Paramounts, the Universals, the 20th centuries to make this change because what we know is that diversity and representation sell. Uh, you know, and we can look at movies like Coco and Crazy Rich Asians and Black Panther to as just some recent examples of how that's true. The more diverse a project is in entertainment or any industry, the more money it makes, uh, especially if we're talking about both in front of and behind the camera. So those bigger studios um, who are not being more intentional with respect to inclusion are literally leaving money on the table at this point. And so what I think is really interesting is watching content creators, right? But in this case, we're talking about actors and producers and directors who are making their own tables, no longer waiting for a seat at the table at the bigger studios, but creating their own production companies. You know, obviously we have Ava DuVernay as the prototype with all of this. But we also have people like Michael B. Jordan, uh, you know, who created Outlier Society Productions and others who are creating the art that they want to see for the audiences that they want to reach. Um, and so, yes, absolutely. Studios can do more. Congress can do more. You know, the inclusion writer is out there. That would be a great way to say, you know what? you're not going to get this funding, right? Because it all comes down to money. You're not going to get this funding unless you're intentional about who is in front of and behind the camera. And again, we're looking for quality individuals. This is not checking off a box to ensure that you've got, you know, one queer person and one Latinx person and so on. This is about ensuring that there are more opportunities for traditionally underrepresented communities. You know, a lot of the jobs behind the camera, the, the gaffers, the key grips, the production supervisors, are um, covered by a union. Well, you have to have so much experience on film before you can be come into the union, right? But how do you get that experience if you can't get hired because you're not part of the union? And so Congress can work on some of those um, issues as well. There is a lot that can be done. Um, these things could have happened decades ago. This just didn't just start, you know, five years ago with Oscar Sawai. Um, but I'm encouraged by the fact that there are some who are taking this into their own hands and making concrete change. I'd like to talk about the work of the organization and um, and and how we how we sort of conceive representation and why art matters. And then I'll tell you a little bit about myself. <laughs> so I think that um, what I want to share is uh, well, NALAC is what I like to call a full spectrum intermediary. We're a nonprofit organization. So the way that we fulfill the mission that you shared is really through um, membership based work uh, of a you know a giant network of Latinx uh, artists, cultural workers, administrators, lovers of art across the nation, Puerto Rico. Um, also, we, uh, we have leadership programs that focus on uh, developing uh, arts leaders, um, arts advocates and policymakers, and have, we have, we're a partnership with some other organizations and intercultural leadership institute. Uh, we've also got our grant making programs, which are, you know, our standard program focuses on funding a diverse array of Latinx arts. We've uh, also got some really exciting programs that are focused on shifting the narrative around the border areas and also interrupting, challenging, transforming, you know, racist systems as they show up in communities. So those are some of our grant making opportunities. And of course, we, gave, we engage in uh, research and advocacy. So I just kind of wanted to paint the full picture of, of what we do and who we serve. Um, when we think about why representation, I think is so important. I think I think of three key words. I think of the words uh, accountability, abundance, and alchemy. And you know, I think that the common parlance, and when we talk about this type of work, is you know, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? And no, I think this is not a jab at the practitioners that are out there in that world. But I think that. With 30 years of doing this work focused on the Latinx cultural arts field and all its diasporic diversity, that um, really I think it's it's more about um, accountability and justice, right? 
I think that's where it starts. We're kind of, I think, evolving in some ways past the era of firsts. And so um, as Latinx cultural workers and lovers and uh, supporters, it's really important that we have the conversations to achieve justice and accountability within our own community. And that includes, you know, making sure that uh, indigenous and black Latinx folks are, you know, front and center in this work. Um, so that way, you know, it's truly accountable so that when we have an abundance in any, you know, part of the sector that we're really bringing our full, our full, full beauty and power with us. We're not leaving folks behind, you know, um, it's, you know, easy to see that, you know, even in amongst ourselves in spaces of Hispanic or Latinx leadership, there is colorism, you know, there is uh, our own unchecked colorism, bias and racism in our communities that we are in a time where we can address. So that when we have abundance, it's actually genuine and meaningful where we move into these spaces. And then what I think is possible is alchemy. We can actually have real transformation. We might have a country that actually funds its you know, national arts at an adequate level. I'm pretty sure that you know, the city of Berlin's arts budget like dwarfs you know, the NEA funding and that's tragic. It's just a straight tragedy. So that when we get to that level of abundance, we have it grounded in some real genuine change. And um, I would say that as far as the, the importance of art and culture itself is that I've, my notion is that it's where we as human beings, as community, where we make and produce meaning with one another. You know, I think that, you know, you asked a little bit about my pathway. I was a hip hop performing artist and a teaching artist prior to becoming, you know, arts administration and a wonky policy person. And what struck me, you know, then and now is that art is deeply personal. It's, and culture is the most intimate space we really can share um, as human beings, you know. Um, and in some cases, some people are so socially or uh, personally traumatized that doing a poem with them, writing a play, dancing, moving, that can be the medicine that they need to take care of their own basic needs. You know, I think back to being a case manager and working with young people where they wouldn't be motivated to even show up to school, uh, you know, go to the, uh, collect food at our little food bank we had in the school site. What got them to that point was art and culture and that connection that's created. It paves the way for real transformation, you know. For me, identity has always been super critical and a part of everything that I do. Um, when I first decided to run for office in Nevada, I very much ran for, as, as a Latina, as a young woman, as all of the identities that I bring to the table, not because I should be judged on those things, but because there is almost no representation at every moment that we look around. And so because we are so critically underrepresented, it's almost like we have to lead with our identity in order to make ourselves known in those spaces and to be those voices as loud as we possibly can um, for the rest of our community. For me, Alejandro, representation is important because it really gives us a, a, a sense of how we feel about, it, about ourselves. It, you know, the way that we look at ourselves as community, as individuals, is a lot of times formed by what we see on television, uh, for better or for worse, and on film. And so, um, to me, the fact that we are able to represent ourselves accurately and with a variety of, of voices is everything. Um, you know, in my case, I was very blessed to have this opportunity to be on, on a, this show, East Los High, which was the second uh, show that Hulu had basically um, taken on as a Hulu original series. And so the fact that we had the opportunity because of technology, because of this sort of pioneering media to show America who we were in a very authentic way, not something that was the typical tropes or stereotypes. We, there, we didn't have any gang members um, maids or, or gardeners. Not that there's anything wrong with that part of our community, but what the showrunner wanted to do was expand what America knew of our community. So I think it really made a difference in the way, and just by the response that we got from many of the fans and critics and, and the like, I think we really did a great, we did a really great job of, of introducing different voices. and. And I, and I really, um, you know, credit technology for doing that. I don't think we could have done 
what we did on East Los High had Hulu not existed and had streaming services not really uh, sort of taken on this um, sort of mission of creating original programming. So I think it was, it, 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 you know, the importance of representation in media is, is everything. And so, yeah, I think we're in a really great point right now to further that, uh, to, to take that further. I think that moving forward, one of the things that really is going to take our community uh, to the next level is, is really the internet um, and broadband specifically, because the internet allows um, people from not only our community locally, wherever we live in the U.S. or abroad, uh, to get to gain information, but but really anywhere in the world, it's it's a it's a very valuable tool for democratizing information. And I think that uh, one of the things that, for example, our community here in Hollywood did was uh, on the heels of the Emmy nominations, um, and a letter out to Hollywood, an open letter to Hollywood was written by many of us in the community called the hashtag and Latin exclusion letter. And uh, this one document that really talked about the, um, the issues really standing in the way of Latinos and Latinx, the Latinx community uh, really having more of a say in the kind of programming that exists um, was, a, was a really incredible um, sort of waking moment for, for us all. Um, the, the letter went viral. It was picked up by all the, uh, the outlets. Uh, it was written about by CNN and, uh, you know, Hollywood Reporter and Variety and everyone else. And so I think, again, that wouldn't have been possible if it hadn't been for the internet and, and, uh, and broadband. And so I think we're at a very great place to sort of take the next steps in, in bringing more of our voices to the fold of Hollywood. Um, and there's a lot of organiza organizations here in Hollywood that are really trying to find more voices other, the outside of what we normally would see, uh, the people that are already the regular players and such. And, um, and, the, and it's great. It's a great moment for young Latinx uh, filmmakers and, and writers and creators to, to really be involved. And, and I credit that to, to the internet. I was born in Texas to, to uh, my parents are from El Salvador. My mom moved back to El Salvador. So I grew up between both countries, visiting my dad in Texas every year. That really helped to form my identity um, because, of course, I was always a Salvadoreña, but I was always a Salvadoreña living the experience in the U.S. and this bicultural, bilingual person, right, where I didn't really feel I fit in, which is a lot of the narrative and um, a lot of uh, Latinos feel. Um, and when I, I, not only that, but I was not the traditional person that wanted to do what an Salvador was expected, which was to become a wife or, you know, um, inherit something or, you know, launching your business and all that wasn't really where, 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 where you fit in. Um, and I wanted to study media and television. So I moved back to the States and I did that. And I have always lived in, in creating content for Latinos. So I actually have never had a job where I'm not working with the Latinx community. It started with Univision and then MTV Latin America in Mexico, and then here with Mundos, which is now NBC Universal, until um, really it's always, so always creating content, always talking to Latinos um, and creating content by and for us, but in the different perspectives of Latin America, and then creating content for US Hispanics, which we know is different, but that afforded me this bigger global view of, of how we identify, right? That, that as we all know here, and we've said um, a lot during Hispanic and Latinx Heritage Month, right? That we're not a monolithic group, that we're not a homogeneous group, but it's easy to say that. But then what does that mean? Especially if you're coming from digital media, if you're coming from brands, if you're trying to speak to all of these communities at once, right? Um, and try to capture, so how do we talk in cultura? How do we create that? And I've been afforded through my life experience. I really feel that that knowledge has just embedded in me. And when I became a mom um, and I had quit my job, and I love telling this part of the story because it is powerful. I, I quit my job and the recession came. Um, I had no idea. And I was out of work because I had quit my job and my husband had lost everything too. But what I turned into was digital, the digital space, blogs. This was 2008, 2009. 
Um, the digital space, what's important about what tech has been able to do specifically for our communities was that it has been able to democratize our voices. Blogging did just that. It allowed a mom without a work, almost in food stamps, at, in LA, trying to survive in LA with no family around me, um, to be able to create a space to where not only it became a community to me, but it became a community to those women around, um, of women that needed it as well, and parents, which was my blog. I was a mommy blogger, uh, which was my blog called Spanglish Baby for Parents Raising Bilingual and Bicultural Kids. So what I did was that I, 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 I didn't look, I didn't have to do research, I didn't have to do data. I knew what I, as a Latina mom, needed, which was the resources for me that I wanted my daughter to stay connected to her roots and stay and learn the language as I had done um, at an early age, right? And I wasn't finding those resources. So as many of us have done and continue to do, I created my own table. I had, I knew how to create content that spoke to us and by us. So I just continued doing that without, and I didn't need money because thanks to the digital tools, I could create a blog with $10, right, to host a site and, and really just our experience. And that just grew um, I became a well-known mommy blogger at the time, but that allowed me to open the door, right, to open the doors into these brands that wanted to learn more about how to reach Latina moms, because we had to find a way, we were reaching ourselves, right, we were creating that community, and that just expanded then to what is now We All Grow, because I launched Latina Bloggers Connect, which was the first network connecting Latina bloggers with brands. And really, I didn't understand back then truly the impact of what I was creating because for me it was I need to make sure that we can all continue doing this and using this space. And to do that, we need to monetize. And obviously, if I was going to go to anyone to try to raise funds 10 years ago as a mom blogger with the idea of trying to connect Latina bloggers and to allow us to continue sharing our stories... No one was opening the door for me. AT&T nos ha conectado cada día por más de 100 años. Y estamos aquí para apoyarte, especialmente ahora, haciendo todo lo posible por mantenerte conectado. Con la fuerza de nuestra red y nuestra gente, podemos seguir aprendiendo, seguir compartiendo y más que nada, seguir juntos. Es lo que siempre hemos hecho. Y lo que haremos siempre. 